be Joe. Yes. So, Joe, let's kick things off. Can you share with the Grab Fellowship? WTF is content marketing in a nutshell. Wow. Okay. So this is a question that's been debated for a long time. And in reality, there's two types of marketing. There's push marketing, which is advertising, and there's pull marketing, which is generally considered inbound marketing, which is content marketing. So traditionally, content marketing started with the likes of HubSpot. And what they're doing is they're creating a bunch of blogs in order to get traffic, in order to get potential customers. So they were really the, the trailblazers when it came to content marketing. But what's interesting now is you see not only a lot of organizations, B2C and B2B do it, um, but also, let's see, um, but also, what does it say? Um, you can hear me all right, right? Okay, perfect. I, as I say, now you see a lot of individual content creators doing it. I think that's how Jeremiah, Jeremiah and I first um, got connected is we, I saw some of his videos and I was like, this guy is doing some incredible work. And I found out more about his business and then we collaborated with projects. We actually just wrapped up a project about an hour ago together. And once again, it just started because I saw his videos and I was like, man, this guy's doing some really cool stuff. I want to find out more about him and what he's up to. And that has blossomed into so many different business relationships um, off the back end of that. So yeah, that's our story in, in a nutshell. Nice. Okay, push and pull. Now, let me ask you, okay, Joe, what would you say has been your most exciting content marketing campaign that you've worked with a brand? Uh, so that, that's a funny one because I'm in B2B, which um, one participant in a previous session I was doing called it Boring to Boring. And in a lot of cases, it, it, it is to some extent. So for me, I try to build campaigns or initiatives that are not the sexiest, but actually are effective. So doing simple tweaks. So for example, working with a lot of big tech companies. And one of the things we're doing is just tweaking the language. So one specific example is if you look at EDMs, um, a lot of EDMs feel very corporate. They feel very stuffy. There's a lot of big CTA buttons. And as a result, you don't really feel connected to that specific brand. So one thing we've, we've done is kind of flip the script, made it more personal. So it sounds like it's an individual behind the keyboard. And once again, not super sexy, but it's had a huge impact in terms of the results they've had from open rates to click rates, um, as well as you know RSVPs for some of their upcoming events. So for me, I always like the unsexy things that just work. Nice. You know, it's very, very interesting that you're talking about EDMs, right? Because uh, not too long ago, I went to a Kaigo festival and, okay, JK, EDM is, is electronic uh, direct mailers which is kind of like newsletters. Bob, why the hell are you holding a spatula or a thong? Or what the hell is that in your hand? Okay, guys. Oh, it's a spoon. It's a spoon. Okay, I thought it was like a spatula of sorts, like you're cooking and watching this. Amazing. Yeah, Bob is trying to give, give Joe a high five, but Joe is just smiling. Okay, anyway. I'm on the other oh. side. There we go. <laughs> okay, now, when you talk about uh, e newsletters, right? Yes. Do you think because for the Grab Fellowship specifically, our medium of choice is actually videos? Hmm. Why do you think a traditional medium or a legacy method like newsletters work for B2B content? So it's a good question. I think there's definitely opportunity for videos. So if you look at my newsletter, it's actually a compilation of the best videos that I've created. And best not being from my own point of view, but looking at the analytics across YouTube, across LinkedIn and across other platforms to see what are people engaging with? What are they watching? So I look at average um, duration volume and I put those as my most popular ones. So to your point, I start everything I start off with is video. And then we can talk about a little bit later how I slice and dice that. But if I look at the newsletter itself, all the content really comes from the snippets of my, my videos. And it's very similar to kind of your newsletter as well, too. Um, but I think mine is more written as a copywriter because I'm more of a copy style versus you. You have the big kind of gifts and stuff like that, which I think both styles work quite well. They really um, illustrate our personalities. Nice. Thank you, Joe. So in the chat, I've actually placed, you know, Joe's subscription for his newsletter. It's very straightforward. It's very simple, organized and relatable. Okay, and he does add a lot of links to the videos that he's done throughout the week. Now, now this is a very interesting point, okay, guys. 
the fact that Joe uses EDMs kind of like a compilation, compilation of all his video links. So newsletters is like the catalyst or the enabler to push out video content. Mm. Now, I know a lot, Joe, you have to understand that a lot of the Grab Fellowship members here in this room right now, mm -hmm. uh, tw all 19 of them, they choose different platforms like YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram to push out their content. Do you think that newsletters and social platforms can marry to, to create a very cohesive um, content campaign? Yeah, I mean, there are some newsletters that have like um, shared on different social media platforms. That's one way of doing it. I would also encourage, in addition to the public, also having a share of WhatsApp or a share via Telegram or whatever platform is big in your specific market. Because if you think about the way we share, I very rarely share videos on social. I usually share it on WhatsApp. So if I see something cool that uh, Jeremiah has done or I want to share, then I will go ahead and share directly um, via WhatsApp. So I think having those buttons either on your newsletter or your website can help encourage sharing via these dark social platforms. Interesting, interesting. So you see WhatsApp as a, another platform for publishing and syndication, right? Uh, absolutely. I think there's a couple of different ways to do it. There is the mass blast, which I'm not a huge fan of. I know some people have WhatsApp groups or Telegram groups where they add people and they share things. Um, I like to do the one-on-one -on -one style. That way I can tailor the messaging towards that. So for example, if I saw a, a video on, you know, best video editing tools, then I might go ahead and ping that off um, Jeremiah on WhatsApp and say, hey man, what do you think about these? Have you tried any of these? So we continue the conversation on a one way, but I've seen some people do it in group chats as well too. Nice, nice, nice. Can you share, you know, with the, with the Grab gang, what is the inspirations or what will be the benefits with direct WhatsApp messages with a video link? I think, once again, it, most people, at least for me, I'm getting flooded with emails. I don't know if it's the same for, for you guys as well, too. So when I'm getting flooded in emails, I quickly sift through and I say, okay, what's important, what's not? And I'll generally check the client stuff first, then my employees, and then everything else gets flooded towards the bottom. But for the most part, I probably get less um, WhatsApp messages, more from people I know because I don't open up to everyone. So you are filtering out, um, you're standing out from the pack versus emails. Social, I think, is, is the toughest because you're standing out among everybody. Emails are a little bit easier. If you want to get even further down in terms of uh, personalization and that one-on-one -on -one connection, then WhatsApp or your direct messaging platforms are the, the lowest hanging fruit there. Nice. Lowest hanging fruit. Well, uh, okay, you know what? I was about to make a joke, but I realized it might not be appropriate for everyone. But moving on. So, you know, you mentioned something that I, I really like. Okay, you talked about, okay, guys, settle down, settle down. You, you mentioned personalization, right? Now, in content marketing, how does personalization and tailoring the content direct to your audience work? Because I have I've shared, you know, just now when you were bugging in and out with, you know, our great Singapore internet, uh, you, you, I was sharing about how content marketing is actually showing people how good you are instead of telling people how good you are, mm. right? So how does personalization come into the mix? Great, great question. I'll share a couple different formats. and I think it's still applicable to whatever format you're doing. So blogging used to be one of the most popular ones. And if you look at the amount of blogs and articles that are going out every day, it's overwhelming. And it's getting really, really tough to stand out in terms of search engine optimization ranking well on Google. So one thing that's worked out very well for me and some of my clients is getting very specific in things like the headline, for example. And this could be the same thing if you're doing your description for your video. So the way we broken it up in B2B is to break it up into different clusters. So for example, we may be targeting a specific geography. Jo, we may jo, be targeting jo, a specific re repeat, um, repeat, persona, repeat from a specific audience. Wait, Joe, repeat from the part where you talked about the headline because you started to bug out a bit. <sighs> okay, so what happens when you... Yes. Okay, yes. Can you hear yes. me now? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, yes. Headlines, back to headlines. I, I was about okay. to tell a joke to fill the awkward silence, but thank you for coming back to rescue me. <laughs>
<laughs> All right. No, no worries. No worries. Um, so real quickly, we're talking about headlines and this applies to your B2B, um, sorry, your video descriptions as well too, is what we look at is different buckets. So we may be targeting a specific geography or a specific persona or a specific industry. Having those in the headline makes a huge difference. So I'll give you an example. Most video subscription or headlines would be like, you know, top 10 video tips for 2021. Once again, very generic, very broad. But let's say I wanted to do one like top 10 video editing tips for Singapore or small business owners. So which one do you think if I'm scrolling through and it's going to catch my eye? So the same thing applies. Yes, the, the latter, because it's meant like it's intended for you. So that's a form of mass personalization. And the same thing applies whether you're doing it, you're promoting your videos on social. So this is something we realized at LinkedIn is analyzing, calling out a specific audience. So for example, if I'm trying to call out videographers or marketers or CFOs, for example, calling that out in the beginning of your description can help increase the engagement within that specific um, audience. So little tips and tricks like this can really help you stand out. Um, once again, that's mass personalization. If you wanna go even deeper, you we talked about EDMs. You know, obviously there's a lot of ways you can make your EDMs far more personalized. Um, you can segment your database into different buckets. So we do the same thing as well too. We have a bucket for marketers, for sales, for HR, and maybe for leadership. Now, the reason we do that is because we realize that marketers want different things from salespeople and salespeople want different things from leadership team and so on and so on. So by segmenting our list, um, we can provide them with a little bit more personalized content than the big generic blast that most companies do. Okay, interesting, interesting. Now, when we, when we talk about, um you know, uh, content marketing and personalization for B2B, right? How can we try and convert B2B into B2B to C? So right now, the Grab fellows, right? All, all uh, 19 here right now, they are creating content specific for Grab, you know, to talking about specific items, whether is it merchants whether is it riders whether is it delivery how can an organization like grab utilize creators to make personalized content what what, what would you say um, would be a idea that you could give yeah so i can actually share my grab grab experience because i used to work with grab uh, they were a client of mine and one thing I was working with them when they were launching Grab Foods in Southeast Asia. And one of the things we did was to tailor it to the specific markets. So we would highlight the top 10, you know, um, best halal restaurants in KL, for example, as a way to make it more personalized. Um, we did that as kind of the, the, the overarching one in terms of mass personalization. But I, an idea that I had, which I never got to implement, which hopefully you guys can do, is to interview some of the, the, the writers, some of the grab drivers, find out their stories. I always wanted to do kind of like a talk show-esque um, format with some of the, the grab writers and drivers, because I do that anyway. It's because they always have these fascinating stories. And if you can get permission from both grab and then the, the drivers or writers, um, I think that'd be a fascinating story because a lot of them, maybe they, they didn't start out as drivers or writers. Some of them were former IT consultants or sales folks or whatever they, they were. and it's always interesting to, to find out how they ended up you know, working with Grab and kind of what have been some of the interesting stories that they've, they've encountered in speaking with people because they deal with all kinds of people. I mean, particularly when you know, the clubs were open, I used to get all kinds of stories from drivers telling me about you know, drunk people and stuff like that. And it, I always find it really, really entertaining. And I'm like, why isn't anyone capturing these stories and sharing them? So that for me is something that, once again, I had the idea, um, I, I think should be implemented. I think if Grab is here, then hopefully we can get the, that approval on that. And I think that's something that could be very cool. Damn, I was muted. Shucks, man, my climax just fell. Well, all these creators, right? These Grab creators, they do actually have access to riders, to merchants. and Currently, right now, the, the theme for the, the month is actually merchants, you know, mm, yeah. how, how, how has Grab helped them? And when, you know, 
interestingly, you mentioned about drunk stories, right? When we talk about content marketing, we present both the good and the bad. Mm. Am I right to say that? Yes. Now, for a brand like Grab, if they keep pushing the good agenda, then it might give a very, very skewed version of, oh, you know, Grab is like this almighty savior that saves mm. the universe of Southeast Asia and things like that. Right? Am I right to say that? But now, yeah. content marketing, remember, like I mentioned right at the start, is showing people how good you are, not telling people. Mm. So by presenting the bad, right, you are presenting failures. And through failures, you can actually tell amazing stories. So just like Joe's idea, he said, okay, you know what, let's, let's, let's have a round uh, uh, um, talk show, maybe three grab delivery uh, personnel, and then ask them, what has been your horror story? Like you deliver food to this person and this person was like, this is not what I order, you know, flips the tables, does like a choke slam in people's elbow and all that kind of nonsense, WWE stuff, right? And that would be a very, very interesting piece of content. Why? Mm -hmm. There is the, you know, uh, uh, elements of virality because it is something that we are talking about failure. But how, okay, now this is the question I want to ask you, uh, Joe. Prepare yourself. All right. How can Grab utilize stories of failure for their benefit or horror stories for their benefit? Yeah, so I'll give the rationale in terms of why to do that and then an example of a company that's done that. So first, I think it's important that the leadership buys into this approach. Um, if not, like I said, most companies are doing what you said, which is basically very positive stuff is very scripted um, that works better as like an advertisement but it's not necessarily content marketing so it's important going back to the push and pull concept we had earlier you know pushing is essentially looking hey look how great we are look at all the awards we've won that's pushing your, your message versus pulling means pulling them in through different stories um, so one example and i won't name the uh, university because i teach for another one but there i interviewed the marketing head and i said okay how do you guys stand out? You guys are not the NUS of the world. You're not the SMU. You're not kind of that top tier school. How do you stand out in terms of your marketing? And he says, we realize that. We realize we are the underdogs. And so one thing we try to do is we try to keep it real in our communications. So for example, we will interview students to find out the things they liked and maybe the things they didn't like. Um, and they would interview um, alumni and talk about, you know, uh, for example, uh, data science, you know, people will say data science is very boring um, and talking about the pros and cons of, of a career because definitely there's there's pros and cons, but not always people always talk about the, the pros. I mean, there's so much growth, the salaries are good, but it, in the interviews, you're like, oh yeah, it's the same thing over and over. You're doing like this grunt work and then 1% of the time you do something amazing, but their time you're just like slugging away. Um, so once again, he's telling the real stories. And what I loved about it is they did all these interviews live. So they live streamed all these interviews. So even if they wanted to cut the feed, I mean, I guess technically they could, but if you could tell that they were intentionally um, pulling the plug, they just let people talk about what they want to talk about. And I thought it was a brilliant way of, you know, we we're talking about telling these stories, but in a way that people actually talk. So even if Jeremiah and I have a conversation, not the entire conversation won't be 100% positive. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about things that'll frustrate us and things like that, but that's, that's the way we communicate. And I think a lot of brands are scared to do that because they're scared of the repercussions of what may happen if someone has a negative experience. But it's the same thing with TripAdvisor. If you see someone with all five star ratings review and there's a thousand, you start to question like, is this real? Or is this a bot? Or is this, you know, what, what's going on here? So the same thing applies to your messaging and your communications. There has to be a little bit of, um, you know, negative or a little bit of dirt on, on it. Otherwise, it's, it's just boring. Wow. When you say 1,000 reviews and all five stars, sounds like my company that I run. Now I'm a bit concerned. <laughs> well, people think that the company that I run is too squeaky clean. Well, um, okay. Joe has frozen. He's just holding the cup to his mouth for me. I don't know if, if that is the rest, uh, similar to the rest of the class. For me, he disappeared. He went to the to the metaverse or something. Oh, there he is. <laughs> okay, he's back. He's back. Nice. Okay, now 
I, I, I thank you so much for, for sharing, uh, Joe, a lot of things. I want to ask like one or two more questions before I open up the entire session for the rest of the, of the fellowship to, to ask their questions, okay? So one, one, one question that I, I've, I've been burning to ask you, okay, Joe, is that do you think that content marketing, you know, is something that brands should focus more on? Let's say, okay, in this context, let's talk about Grab. Should Grab focus more on content marketing in the form of bad stuff? Okay, or, or, or not say bad. Let's rephrase that to negative stuff, like what you mentioned. Do you think Grab or even the Grab creators should maybe share one or two stories on that? So, I mean, it really, it really depends on their appetite for risk. I think they, they should, but I think there's one way to introduce it, but make it a little bit more palatable for the corporate team members. And that's looking at you know, story arc arcs. So if you look at the story arcs throughout history, there's always some kind of downfall before you come back up. So I think that's why we all love a good underdog story. If you think, you think of you know, the movie Rocky, you know, he gets beat up and then he gets, he gets knocked out so many times and then eventually he wins. I think it's the same thing when I talk to the grab drivers. You know, they maybe didn't want to be a grab driver. Maybe they got laid off, but then now they, they're becoming a grab driver because they enjoy the freedom and flexibility or, you know, they hated their boss and they said, screw it, I quit my job, I'm going to do this now. So I think, once again, those aren't necessarily negative but they are kind of not the, the happy, you know, glossy things that, that, that go in advertisements, but they happen in real life. So I think by sharing more of those and then sharing the, the rise, I think could be an interesting way to introduce it and make it more palatable for a corporate audience to buy into. Nice, nice. So Hui Min, I hope you've heard that, you know, risk appetite. Maybe Grab would be more open to talk about different things that is honestly a bit more counterintuitive and agey and even risky, but has the potential to be a benefit or even be a PR campaign for its own benefit. Okay, my, my, my good friend, Joe, uh, last question I would like to ask. This is, I would say this is the most serious question that I've, I've thought of the entire session. Why are you always smiling? Is it like a like a defect thing or you know, it, it, like... it is. I got Botox, so I can't I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Joe. Uh okay, I, I'm I legit, you know, Joe has 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 been amazing. He's been smiling nonstop. Let's give him a round of applause, everybody. <laughs> now I am going to change the look of this session. Wow. And we are going to have our Ask Me Anything portion of today. Now, guys, if you have any burning questions you would like to ask Joe in terms of content marketing, branding, marketing, did I say marketing? Okay, content marketing, comma, branding, comma, marketing as a whole, PR or, or anything related to B2B, okay? Let's, let's ask away. You can write in the chat or you can... Raise your hands, just like Bertram. So I am going to get Bertram to take the hot seat. Bertram, unmute yourself. Ask away, my good friend. Hi, hi Joe. Hi, hi everyone. Um, I'm not sure if I'm nagging. Uh, if I am, let me know. You are not nagging. And nagging, neither are you lagging. So. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, because I can't see everyone. I don't, I'm not sure why. Because, uh, yeah, something wrong with my Zoom or something. Okay, anyway, the quick question is, we were talking about... Um, Showing the downside of uh, the the brand or the or the company, Joe, may I ask you if there is a specific way that you teach to your client on uh, showcasing the the negative or the downside of uh, the project or or even the brand? Yeah, absolutely. I get this question quite a lot in terms of buy in, and one thing I always try to do is to make it personal to the individual. So I'm gonna pick on Hui Ming because she's on this call. Uh, I was, if I was trying to get buying from Hui Min, I say, hey, Hui Min, what was, you know, your favorite Netflix show or movie that you watched recently? And she may say, oh, I enjoyed this, this show or movie. And I said, okay, cool. Now tell me, was, was that movie or show kind of all happy, like nonstop for, you know, two or three hours? And she's like, no, 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 actually, you know, this character, he was trying to deal with this thing. And then, 
he was really, really found it really frustrating and failing. And eventually he, you know, he, he or she did something which was, was amazing. And I said, it was a cool story, right? And she might say, yeah, it was, it was really cool. I loved it. And I say, okay, why don't we do the same thing for Grab? So I, that's the way I always position it is to make it, like I said, as personal to them as possible, get them talking about the things they like and then say, okay, why don't we doing this for, for our company? And then there, there may be some conversation around that, but at least you get the, the mind going where they, they, they want to be part of it as well too. So getting them on part of the, the story as early as possible can help in terms of getting buy-in. Nice. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Hopefully that uh, answered your question, Bertram. Thank you. All. Wow. Now we got Ibrahim. Okay. Okay, cool. Next question. Anyone? Raise your physical hands, your digital hands, your, your cyborg hands, uh, whatever hands that you might have. Ask away, my good friends. Oh, okay. Okay. We have uh, Mr. McKay. The hot seat is yours. All right. So I've seen uh, recommendations that social media for companies should be about building a community or addressing a community. Uh, Grab actually has communities that exist, I think, without them even working on it, at least in the Philippines. So you have like Grab Driver Facebook, mm -hmm. Facebook groups. Um, and then Grab, I'm, as far as I know, they didn't create it. It just kind of exists without them. Is there a way for us as uh, video creators to kind of leverage those groups without, uh, every time I see Grab try to do something like this, it, it's, um, it, it comes across kind of, it's not, it's not the same. So they have this thing yeah. called, uh, to translate it roughly, it's called like the, the boss, the clever boss club. And, uh, and they, they send text blasts and everything. And, and uh, it's not the same as these organic Facebook groups where people feel safe to complain about the, the company or say, you know, say, tell tactics that they've you know, figured out to make it work well. But I think they also, you know, sometimes it's, it's like a club. Clubs are really strong, at least here. Mm. So what can we do as creators to make the most of something like that? Or um, what, do you, what can you say about those sort of things, too? So I think, I think it's a wonderful question. I think Grab should definitely be implementing that. Not necessarily, I mean, you can do both, like you said, organize your own, but I think there's more power in leveraging existing ones. Um, I think the same thing applies in Singapore. So if you see all the, the drivers or all the riders after their shift, they'll all catch up for drinks or, you know, or grab some food and stuff like that. So organically, they have a very tight knit community that they've kind of built over the years. And they're very, very close to each other, whether it's the drivers, the merchants or, or the riders. So once again, the, the key is to be part of that. Um, so I know I saw the uh, video or photo of Anthony Tan, who's the, the CEO and founder of, of Grab, actually getting on the, the bicycle and delivering um, food. So I think it, it's going to take someone on the Grab corporate side to either be part of that, you know, either sitting on the rides or going and delivering food to be so they get accepted. Do you know what I mean? If it's a corporate, a fully corporate person coming in here and saying, hey, guys, I like the community you built. Um, is it OK if I seed some of my content and you guys can share it among your followers? You can be like, you're probably going to get blocked. Um, so I'll share a quick story in terms of an analogy to bring it to life is, you know, when I moved to, to China about 15 years ago, there's two types of Americans. There was Americans who refer, refused to learn any Chinese. And there was the Americans like me who went full on. So you could see instantaneously, you know, among the, the locals, which one they accepted within their inner circle. So I think the same thing Grab will have to do, they will have to kind of infiltrate it, but in a way where, like I said, they're taking part of the experience. That's only full time, but maybe they do it a couple of times a week so they can better understand. Then when they're having coffee or they're, you know, chatting with someone online, they can relate to them more versus them saying, oh, you know what? Yeah, we had this great um, luncheon at the, the corporate office and we got all this stuff done in and it's like, we're out here, you know, grabbing street food and stuff like that and smoking cigarettes and drinking and stuff like that. So they we have to relate to them on a different level than I think they are doing now. Thanks. A great question though. All right. I totally forgot that our dear Joe spent like half his life in China. Yes, I've been in I've been in Asia for quite a quite a while. Hence my accent is is all over the place. Someone asked <laughs> where I'm from, they're like, I was like, I don't even know anymore. <laughs> Yeah, obviously from the chocolate factory, Joe, right? Because you're so sweet. Your smile uh, is so sweet. You're going to make me blush. 
<laughs> I can't tell if you are honestly like because you're always just smiling. So I don't know. I, I do. Do you ever get angry, Joe? I mean, <laughs> uh, you should ask my son if I ever get angry. <laughs> ooh, ooh, what kind of pickup line was that? Hasha, can you don't expose me? Gosh, sheesh. Okay, good question. Good question. Um, um, uh, Jerome, I actually, I actually also wanted to add on to that. Now, when you try and do community building, especially um, with content marketing, you sometimes uh, fall into that trap where you force the community to grow. And when you enforce it to grow, it is, it is non-organic and it will usually never happen. Okay, it will usually never happen. So the best thing to actually see growth, especially with your grab mentorship, or you know what? Let's talk about post grad mentorship. When you start to continue your own content creation journey, it is really to keep it organic, be relatable, and be yourself. Okay, the key word here is authenticity. I know it's the buzzword of like twenty eighteen and twenty nineteen, but content marketing is really all about authenticity. What is your brand voice? What is your brand tone? Now, all, all 19 of you here, you all have your own brand voice, your brand personality, because you yourself have your own personal brand. Okay. Now, along those lines of personal branding, right? Joe also is a prolific coach on personal branding. His LinkedIn profile is amazing. Okay. I, I'm not even I'm not even joking when I say it is amazing. Uh I would like to get Joe to maybe share one. Oh yes, Bob, you are fast, man. You are fast. Go and go and follow Joe right now, my my friends. Joe, share share with us, right? Uh, in terms of B two B, can it that the same vein of branding can it also be translated to personal branding? Uh, absolutely. And once again, I'll share a quick story in terms of why I believe personal branding. So when I moved to Singapore about eight years ago, I felt like a leopard. I mean, no, no one would get in touch with me. No one would accept my messages. Um, no one would hire me. So I spent several kind of months in like a severe depression because once again, I didn't know anyone. I had no family. Um, yes, leopard, correct. Um, so once again, I was really, really struggling because when I said I had no personal brand, I had done very well in China and had built a personal, how do I, you know, how do I build that relationship? How do I build my community? And so for me, one thing that I've done that's really, really helped is to highlight others. And I think you as videographers, you have a great opportunity to do this. I'm a writer, so I do it in a very different style. Uh, I used to write for Forbes, Inc. and, and HuffPost. And one thing I would do is if I found fascinating people, I said, hey, can I interview you for a story I'm doing? I'd love to feature you. And it was because of that idea of me featuring them, them being the star. So if you look at all of my articles, I've written hundreds of articles for Forbes and those guys, um, you never see my face. I mean, you'll see a very small, like a uh, picture at, at the top, but like the big, big shot, big money shot is always someone else. And that was always my intention to, to highlight different people, different races, different ethnicities, different genders. Um, as, as a way to, to tell their story. Because only recently have I started telling my story, and I think that's my next book that's coming out. I've, I've put off telling my own story for many, many years, but people tend to like these kind of anecdotes. So anyways, fast forward. Was there, um, like, a, was there like a subtle plug for your next book, Joe? I just, I just let people know. <laughs> once, it's, once it's out, I'll share it with you guys. Um, but, but anyways, so fast forward. And eventually I built up the community. Um, within five years, I was speaking on stage with royalty. I actually spoke um, after Anthony Tan at the biggest innovation conference a few years back. So once again, going from someone who literally no one would uh, even meet me for coffee, getting rejected hundreds of times for jobs and for different projects to now what I'm doing where I've been asked to, uh, I have 10 talks, 10 talks, not TED talks, 10 talks this uh, month. Uh, one of the talks I'm doing, Obama is also on the talk as well too. So it's it's quite a quite a journey that I've had over the five, past five or six years. And I think that's why I believe in personal branding so much. 
Okay, uh, Joe, could you, you know, invite Obama on the 27th of August for our last, you know, grab for good mentorship meetup? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll see what I can do. I'll, I'll drop a word to him. Yeah, for sure. Okay, please, please tell him that, you know, the hostess with the mostess will be hosting the Zoom session. You know, it won't be boring and... <laughs> No, legit, Joe. I'm, I'm, I'm not joking, okay? This is a serious... Okay, but anyway... Uh, cool, cool, cool. Any other questions that anybody would like to ask our dear... Oh, uh, alright, alright. Let's have Mr. Baguette. Hey, Baguette in the room. Um, quick question on, on what you're saying around personal branding. What are some of the tips or recommendations that you have to build personal branding? I think a lot of us are getting started. Uh, we're just at the beginning stages of our content creation journey and we're still trying to find either a voice or, or the kind of community we want to create content for and so on. What are some of the tips that you have to strengthen and build our personal branding when it's at this stage at stage zero? So that's a very good question. I was basically on the video side in your exact shoes about a year and a half ago. So I started the podcast. It was a video, video podcast, very similar to Joe Rogan's, although not as popular. Um, and so I didn't really know what my style or the voice or topics should be. So I actually interviewed a bunch of different people from different backgrounds. And then I got a sense in terms of what do I like talking about? What do I like learning about? And what is my audience like? Um, hearing about. So I started to filter in even more, even more with each episode that I published. Okay, what are people um, getting more into? And that's why I kind of focused on renaming it the BB Marketing Agent Podcast. It was originally called The Cup of Joe for about a year, because once again, I had no idea what it was. Um, I actually had people vote and they liked the, the name of Cup of Joe. But as I progressed in it, I said, okay, we're having a lot of great conversations around B2B marketing, particularly in Asia. And it's something that hasn't really been addressed. So I was surprised when I went to register the name BB Marketing Asia Podcast, um, it, it didn't exist. So same, same thing when I was at Forbes. Um, there, you know, there's ton, Forbes writes about everything under the sun, but I was actually the first contributor to cover digital marketing and PR in, for, in Asia for Forbes. So once again, I, I went deeper because I knew that there was a gap uh, within the market. Um, that I wanted to fulfill. So whether it was the book or the, the podcast or even writing for Forbes, I've kind of honed in over the years. So I think once again, shoot different video styles. I think for you guys, you can do documentary styles, you can do interviews, you can do, you know, whatever, like um, demos and things like that. that. Try the things that you like to do first, because I think that's something that is really important. Like the key is really consistency. And even for me, like I said, I've been doing uh, episode every two episodes every week. Um, now I have a social post going out every day. Um, it's taken me a while to get to this place, but that's something that's really, really important to build your personal brand. I always try to equate it to you, a lot of you guys are probably too young, but whenever you know your favorite TV series used to come on, it used to come on the same time Thursday nights, um, 8 p.m., and you got excited for that. You looked forward to that. The same thing applies to your audience. If they get used to seeing your content and then all of a sudden you drop out for, say, a, a month or two, then they're like, hey, what the hell happened to this person? So I think consistency is really important. And when it comes to finding your voice, like I said, try some different things. Um, see what you like doing. See what your audience um, engages with and then kind of marry the two that way. Nice. I'm, I'm pretty sure that we are kind of around the same age. <laughs> yeah. Okay, anyway. Uh, before before we quickly wrap up the session, maybe we can take one or two more questions. Uh, all right, ta 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 Shmei, all the way from M -M -M Malaysia. Over to you. Hi, Joe. So I want to ask a question about how do you promote like Hi, a very niche um platform? How how do you promote a very niche platform? Yeah. Yeah. So can I find out what your platform is? Okay. So basically, Sorry, what, I, what's your platform if I can ask? Yeah. So I play volleyball and I, I do a lot of volleyball related content and I have this volleyball podcast as well, but because volleyball is so niche, right? So it's very difficult to get the word out. So how do you suggest that I do that? So a couple of different things. And I think I'm stealing a playbook out of what the event companies do, like the top 
uh, event companies in the world. So I, I'm friends with some of them and they tell me how they promote theirs. A couple of different things. When you create your and start publishing your videos, hopefully you're doing it with other, say, volleyball players, you know, tagging them so they see it. Um, another brilliant trick, which I'm going to start doing now, and I think um, Jeremiah has done this previously, is sharing the clips beforehand. So, for example, if you have, you know, uh, two or three clips that you've taken of a specific game and you send an email to the volleyball players and saying, hey, I shot these cool clips, feel free to share them on social. Um, all I ask is that you maybe just tag me and I really appreciate it. So getting them to promote it on your behalf is the best way because one, they probably, you know, have different sizes in terms of audiences and also it's within the same community. So if you're they're in volleyball, they're going to have friends who enjoy volleyball, et cetera, et cetera. And they're going to help spread the word organically on your behalf. So that's something you can do um, in your space. Okay, so that means you, you have to ask them to help to promote it because I'm always very shy on asking that part because I feel like it's... Yeah, you know. <laughs> that, that, that's the thing. You, you, you're not asking them to promote it. You're asking them to promote themselves. Okay, yeah, that makes and, sense. And everyone wants to promote themselves, whether they, they, they say it or not. So once again, if you've created some cool video volleyball clips, and for example, I'm featured in it, I'm definitely going to share it because I'm like... I want to I want to make myself look good. So I think if you position it that way, where it's not necessarily promoting your platform, it's an opportunity to showcase their their skills or their personality or whatever it is. They will do it. Uh, okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. No worries. My pleasure. Nice. I I totally I totally agree with that sentiment on promoting yourself. You know, in in the Creator Master Course with the NAS Academy Lesson Seven, we actually do tell you guys. To don't be shy, shy butterfly. Because if you're a shy, shy butterfly, no one will ever know you. And if you create content for an audience of one, then it is just like a vanity project, you know? So with, with creating your content, you need to put the word out there. If not, no one will ever know, right? The greatest masterpiece will just be privy to you. And in that same vein, uh, if you guys uh, want to talk about word of mouth marketing, which Joe just talked about, I actually will be sharing it in my newsletter. I put the link, you know, in the chat group and now I'm promoting myself. Uh, but if you want to share it, you know, you don't have to promote me. You can promote yourself by sharing it. <laughs> Sorry, that doesn't even make sense. So. <laughs> or do you think it's better if you don't talk about it? Because I'm afraid that in the end it will backfire. Yes. So I think some of that stuff, and that's kind of on the extreme end, like that's, if I was a journalist, would be a PR like dream for us. That would be the headlines. And obviously Grab would, would get some, a lot of negative feedback. I think still capture those stories, share it to the Grab folks internally, because if you want to drive change, I think this is what you guys should be doing as videographers and stories. Anyways, capture those stories, compile it, share it with the Grab corporate representatives and saying, look, we're on the front lines. We're actually talking to some of your drivers or writers or whatever it is. Here's what they're actually saying. And then, you know what, if they want to do something about it, great. Um, but at least you are still telling your story in, in the audience that will, it'll matter the most. So if you share it to grab, they can do something about it. If you share it in the public, you know, yes, people will get angry and they'll, they'll write, but nothing will really get done. They made, you know, write a nice press release, but that's about it. So I think by capturing those stories, putting it together, sharing directly with Grab, making them, encouraging them to share within the company, I think it can be a great way to um, strike change and also have that in terms of their own materials. So when they have onboarding for marketers or comms people say, or operations say, look, these are the things we need to be aware of. These are the things our drivers are having. So you're creating it more as an educational piece internally with Grab, to drive change rather than a piece that's going to strike up a lot of like controversy in, in the headlines. Yeah. Thank you so much, Joe. So this is like, we praise publicly, but then we criticize privately. <laughs> Bingo. Yes. Wow. That, that was an amazing question. Yeah. That was, a, that was an incredible question. One that I wasn't expecting, but very nice. All right. Thank you. None of us were expecting that question, man. Awesome. Awesome. That's a good uh, one. Yeah. That was, that was legit. Maybe too legit. But I think it's good, it's good that with, with these kind of questions, you know, you can actually educate collectively, collective mm -hmm. learning. 
because you know honestly honestly joe throughout the entire process we are currently like in the halfway mark for the grad mentorship and there has been some issues that have arised you know uh some pleasant some not so pleasant and one of my my good friends over here our dear stephanos antipas he has kind of been like the middle person between the creators and grab mm. and you know the stories that he can who could he could tell will probably create a book okay he can author his own book grab mentorship dot dot the chronicles you know and part one volume one volume volume one whoa wow exactly it's oh, that, was, that was spot on <laughs> um but before before we actually you know release joe back into the wild with his cup of coffee <laughs> guys focus okay um i i actually want to thank joe for for lending us his time and really sharing his insights on personal branding on content marketing even a bit about pr uh, marketing branding uh, social media you know and and if there is a takeaway right guys all, all all of you right here right now i would say that the main takeaway is that word of mouth marketing is something that is a very very powerful tool that can build you up or bring